Johnny Ilse. Nobody. That's his nickname. Why? They called him that because nobody's perfect. And this guy's career was absolutely perfect. 86 tests for the Wallabies, two World Cup wins, 91-99. The very last match he played was, of course, Tortu Kefu running over Ron Crib and retaining the Bledisloe Cup. And that was just after leading his Wallabies to a series win over the British and Irish Lions. Many, many questions for John. Where to now for Australian and Southern Hemisphere rugby? How can they, on that side of the ditch, rebuild the base of the sport ahead of the 2027 World Cup? John also runs his very expert eye over all four quarterfinals, but concentrates particularly on the two in Marseille, because that's where he's based at the moment. They're almost like the forgotten quarterfinals, those two, aren't they? He is not only a Wallaby legend, his name synonymous with World Cup rugby. The first man to win the World Championship twice. Uh, met him more than once, spent a bit of time with him actually on tour, even did a gig up a hut once, believe it or not. John Eels, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks, Martin. It's always a pleasure. Look, we got so much to talk about, and you're in Marseille, we're in Paris, we've got four absolutely brilliant quarterfinals to look forward to, but it would be remiss not to start with just where we're at at the moment in Southern Hemisphere rugby, and especially from your perspective on Australian rugby, so disappointing that uh, the Wallabies didn't get through to the quarterfinal, we've got questions about super rugby, obviously the news at the moment that you know Eddie's off to Japan and things. I don't want to use the word crisis. That sounds like it's a little exaggerative, but we need to find some solutions for sure, don't we? Yeah, look, there's, look you can look at this a couple of ways. Obviously, like as we look at it from Australia's point of view, we've got a, a few things to consider and uh, exactly what we do to move forward um, because what we've been doing in the past clearly – uh, there, there, there's some things that could be fixed. Now, what those things are, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but as far as the game itself, uh, I think you can look at this a couple of ways. Like, has the Southern Hemisphere dropped back or has the Northern Hemisphere picked up? And it's probably a little bit of both. Um, but, you know, as a game, rugby is a game, as a sport. I mean, this World Cup, we've grown up even more. I mean, the Rugby World Cup has always been... Yeah, you know, has been big and has, has got bigger each time. But when you see some of the advancements of the other countries, the consistency in the play of countries like Ireland and France, and look, that could come undone this weekend. It could be all Southern Hemisphere semifinals, probably unlikely. Um, and it could be an all Northern Hemisphere yeah, semifinals, yeah. Yeah, which, would be, which would be extraordinary. But there is something to celebrate here as far as our game is concerned. Um, when you see Portugal beating Fiji, when you see the scenes of the, the Portugal team arriving back at the, the airport, yeah, it's quite, quite extraordinary what, uh, what continues to happen in rugby globally. At the same time, there's still big concerns about Tier 1 and Tier 2. And I'll go back to 1991, and I, I reference this a lot, and you were at that World Cup where Manu Samoa beat Wales. Since then, you know, these countries, the Pacific Island countries, are still struggling. That's why it's joyous that Fiji are in the quarterfinals. I'm really hoping that they make the semifinals. I'd love a team from it down this part of the world to break through and do that. Still just trying to get that gap so that, you know, the countries that they call Tier 2 play Tier 1 more regularly. I know it's difficult with the hemispheres and things. It's just, it's an inexact kind of scientific problem to solve, really, isn't it? It is. I uh, mean, sports administration is partly art and partly partly science, and we're not sure which part is art and which part <laughs> is science, I think. Um, it's... There is no question. You look at Fiji, look at Samoa almost and probably should have beaten England. I mean, you can say should have won, but you know, they, they, they came you know, so close to beating England. And so that would have meant England this year were defeated by Fiji and Samoa. So you can see that you know, where all these you know, the, the teams have capability, but you're right. Like, how can you give them more exposure in between World Cups? And that's something we we do have to look at uh, because the talent that is generated from, you know, let's just call those three nations, Fiji, Tonga and Samoa, is quite extraordinary and it pops up all around the world, but they just don't get the opportunity to play as units as regularly as the other, as the tier one nations. 
You know, you get welcomed here and you get celebrated here, John, and so does your team, 91 and 99. I mean, you know, you guys came and won a World Cup in France, and I want to talk to you about that, about beating the French on home soil. But the Wallaby side that's gone home, knocked out in the pool stage, we're looking at an All Black side that if we lose to Ireland this weekend, statistically would be the worst that we've ever sent to a World Cup. These aren't great things to be talking about. No, it's hard. But as I say, it's it's hard. Look, Australia you know, is in a you know, worse position than, than New Zealand from our, our performance and where we finished. But it's, as, as I said earlier, like, like New Zealand may get knocked out by the number one team in the world. There's no disgrace in that. Um, and it actually is, is more of a celebration of rugby than anything else. But uh, I think a lot of people you know, would have gone broke uh, betting against New Zealand in, in big matches. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and it's certainly not something I'd be prepared to do. As good as Ireland is, like, like it's a, I play this game 10 times, and it's probably a... a Five each game at the moment with these teams at the moment. It's certainly not a. I can't see it being a six four um, split, or it's certainly not a seven three split. So it's a it's a hard one to pick, and that's and that's what makes this World Cup so exciting. Although disappointing that these two teams are playing at this stage of the tournament, and that's something. You know, if you look at the World Cup and the wash up, as as we do, and this has been said a lot, but you know it's always been the way where the draw has been conducted quite a way before the World Cup, but maybe we do have to revisit it because you don't want another World Cup where the you know, going into the tournament, the top five teams were on one side of the draw. I, mean, I feel for Scotland as much as I feel for any of the others because it's almost certain that they would have gone through on the other side of the draw. 86 tests for the Wallabies, two-time World Cup winner John Eels with us on the platform. You're in Marseille. I want to talk about those two quarterfinals because all the attention, you know, we're here in Paris. And as you say, the top four teams are playing each other this weekend. We kind of, it's, <laughs> kind of forget that, hey, look, there's four teams down, down the other end of France who equally are desperate to win their games and make the semifinals. Yeah, and, and some really interesting matches there. Uh, Fiji beat England earlier this year. Uh, yeah, England almost lost to Samoa last week. Fiji started with a bang, two great performances against Wales and Australia, and then, uh, you know, by their new, by their standards earlier in the tournament, you know, two pretty average performances after that. So, which Fiji side are we going to see uh, this this weekend? If we see the best, then there are a real chance of getting to a, a semi final. Um, but England. While they haven't delivered so far with with um, seamless performances, very very good in the first game against Argentina, but since then haven't been seamless in their performance. Have the game to step up in a quarterfinal stage, unquestioned. You know, you look at the talent that runs through that team; they could be a real threat, not only in the quarterfinal but the the semi to a team that's been battered up by you know in the you know, in Paris the, the week before. And then you look at Argentina and, and Wales. What, what a contest that could be. Um, I suspect that Wales might revert to a more conservative style of play as they have done typically in World Cup quarterfinals and semifinals, just missing out on the final on you know, you know, a couple of occasions um, you know, in, in very narrow losses in semifinals. So you know, they seem to be, Wales seem to be a team that peaked very well for World Cups. Let's look up here then at this end. And, of course, the first semi-final is going to be Ireland against the All Blacks. And, you know, I mean, just personally as an All Black fan, I've, I've, I just haven't felt so unknowing, you know, going into a game. We normally as All Black fans as well, you know, John, I mean, we're a pretty confident bunch and we expect our team to win and we demand our team to win. But as you said earlier in our chat here, I mean, this is an Irish team that has ticked absolutely every box apart from this one. Do you feel it is their time? I think that they couldn't have done any more to make it their time, but the majesty of sport is that it comes with an unknown and, and it, it's sport, you know, the, the people, the teams that are remembered in sport for the right reasons are not the ones that have put themselves in the best position and they're the ones that actually put themselves in the best position and make the most of that position. And that's a huge amount of pressure on the Irish this week. 
the thing that gives me some confidence about the position they find themselves in is when I watched that game, I watched it very closely against Scotland last week, they were clinical in their execution. It'll be different against the All Blacks, but the thing I loved, at the end of the game, there, there was no jumping around, there were no high fives. It was it was as clinical as their performance. You, know, you could see the steel in their eyes. The crowd are going crazy, seeing zombie among other things. Yes. And, and they just had these steely looks to say, Yep, that's just the next step. And and you look at, you know, if you're trying to read the body language and the confidence that the teams have and that it's building, I think to me that was a big sign. But we know they're up against the All Blacks and no one has ever had a, um, a guinea win or an easy win against the All Blacks. So if they are to progress, they're going to have to earn it with probably their biggest win ever. South Africa versus France, this quarterfinal, it's just so difficult to pick, isn't it? You played both teams to win in 1999, John. Um, having having to beat the hosts on their home turf, which is what South Africa are now being asked to do. Just talk us through that and what that actually adds to this occasion for both teams. You know, do you do you bring that into pre-match discussions, especially for South Africa, thinking, okay, how do we quieten this crowd? Um, what are they going through themselves, the French, prior to this, knowing that the weight of the nation is on them at home and so forth? Uh, I suppose it was a, a little bit different in that this would be a bit harder um, for the French, with a different sort of pressure. But, of course, you know, they're, they're also a team like Ireland that have really built beautifully for this World Cup they've faced into a lot of different challenges and they've, you know, they've come through them very well. And, and so because of that, they would have built a lot of confidence. So I think probably if, if you think of the heading into this World Cup, the teams that absolutely knew how they were going to play the game and would not deviate from how they're going to play the game, would, would yeah, in my mind, would have been France and Ireland with South Africa just behind them, with the All Blacks still trying to identify a bit you know, being more specific about you know, that consistency of how they're going to um, approach every game. So I think France bring that into this contest. Again, you look at it, you know, is it a 6-4 out of 10 contest? Maybe France over South Africa? Maybe. Um, but but there's, there's something compelling about that, the power of the South African team and what they can, what they can do. And I think in this instance... In my mind, while it's a hard one to choose, it's a it's a choice between the power of the South Africa and a team that feels like Ireland. This is their time, and they've built this confidence. They've got threat, confidence. They've got threats right across the park. They've got an excellent goal kicker, or probably a, a couple of excellent goal kickers. So they've got the ability to put turn pressure into points, um, and I think maybe that com- combination. Yeah, edges it slightly the French way. John Eels is with us. Let's go back to 1991. And we're talking about a rugby quarter final, and that was Ireland against Australia. Now we're talking about New Zealand versus Ireland, of course. And that quarter final, you lose that, you go home. There is no prize. This, you know, you kind of get forgotten about. But that game will never be forgotten about because they scored with what a minute to go or something. We were thinking we were playing Ireland in that semi final. And then you guys, what did you say to each other at that time, John, to get the ball back, go again, and win that game? with so just so few precious seconds left? Well, I'm ashamed to say what went through my head. Like, I was 21 at the time. I just put my, you know, you've got to remember, it's the amateur days of rugby. I had my favourite shirt, and I just put it in the uh, in the um, dry cleaning that morning. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to get that back before <laughs> if we have to get on a plane tomorrow morning. <laughs> it's, it's embarrassing to say, and it's funny, like, you know, you look at people when you're watching the game and you're thinking... Uh, they, they must be nervous, they must be this, whatever. That was the first thing that went through my mind. And I got a bit better as I got a bit older. But um, yes. it, uh, I, thankfully, Nick Fart Jones was off the field, not thankfully about that, but Nick was injured. Thankfully, we had Michael Liner, who had a really cool head at that time. He just went straight up to the referee, said, how long to go, sir? Uh, I think it was two or three minutes. And he came back to us, and as you remember, the crowd were going crazy. Michael was a softly spoken guy, but in the most composed manner, he said, right, guys, there's X minutes to go. 
let's assume they get this kick, we're three points behind, we, we, we want to kick long, we want to force them to kick into touch, we want to play this move off the line out. And so he really backed it out for us and, and that is exactly what happened. We kicked long, they, they kicked into touch, we had the line out, we tried to play the move, we ended up getting a scrum and then I think we played the move and and it worked to the extent that he, it was Michael himself that scored in the corner. But I think it was, uh, and this will be a difference on the weekend in all the quarterfinals, which team can think clearly under pressure. Um, when the pressure comes on, and the pressure could come on for a range of things, someone might get sent off the field uh, for you know, something, an you know, incidental thing. Um, you, know, you, can, you can have an injury uh, of, of you know, a couple of phases of play might go against you. A team gets a lucky try or two. You know, what do you do? How do you respond to that? And it's you know, being able to think clearly under the pressure of the moment. And, and that will only happen if the team is practiced to be able to, you know, to be able to step back into a composed rhythm and say, okay, this is what we have to do. This is where all our practice steps up in this moment. And that's what happened in, in that moment for that Australian team in 1991. Thank you so much for being so generous and giving us so much time. Always a pleasure catching up with you, mate. I'm now going to ask you to call. I've got a, I've got a few gold euros jangling in the pocket, and if I decided to go down to the local betting shop and put it on, who is making it through? Who are the four semifinalists? Uh, look, I mean, I, I, I would just be guessing. I mean, you would say on form, like, uh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm literally guessing. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking England probably beat Fiji. I'm thinking Wales have a slight edge over Argentina, but it's yeah, it's only slight. I just don't know the other two. <laughs> I do not know. Yeah, you, know, you got those check. Oh, you know, the, the money in your pocket. I, I, I don't think anyone bets successfully against New Zealand too regularly. <laughs> the scrum though, critical. The platform for the All Blacks. Can they get the platform right? Devlin. You've got to love sport. The platform.